So we come to the last passage in the prologue, Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. The third and final fall of man. We've said this a few times, haven't we? There is not just the singular fall. There were three falls of mankind, and this is the third. If you have questions about, well, why, have, why before this series, Doug, have I never really heard of the others? I've only heard of one fall. I plan to address that next week um, as we come to our first of two overview sermons. For now, though, take it as, as this. We have come to the final fall of humanity, which sets the stage for the rest of world history, for the giving of the Torah, Uh, for the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. These events explain why the world is the way it is, and why it will continue to be this way right up until the day of the Lord. And so, if we want to understand our world, if we want to understand where other religions come from, if we want to understand world events, and how we can live alongside other humans in a way that does them good, We really need to understand these verses and what's going on in the world. And so verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now, we can read this account in isolation and come to all sorts of wrong conclusions. We can read it in a way that kind of like, maybe that kind of children's Sunday school, like children's Bible kind of way, which kind of imagines all humanity living in one big camp since the flood, then kind of all moving here, and then en masse deciding to build a tower, and then only after these events, only after that are there anybody living anywhere else in the world. Only after Babel are they spread across the world. But that would be to ignore the chapter that preceded it, chapter 10. Because what did we see in chapter 10? We saw the generations of Noah's sons. And we saw a description of all the nations that came from them. Now, I'm not saying the events of chapter 10 happened, followed by chapter 11 and then chapter 12. Because clearly we, we have Shem's line next, well, at the end of chapter 11... Um, which is just expanding what's already happened in chapter 10. So we're not saying that. But what we're saying is we need to understand these events of chapter 11 happened within the timeline, within the genealogy of chapter 10. And we can say exactly where they happened. They happened in chapter 10, verse 25. We read, To Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in, why? Because in his days... The earth was divided. Okay? So the events of Babel, that is when the earth was divided. It happened in the days of Peleg. Peleg, who is five generations from Noah. This is important. But the city of Babel originated long before Peleg's generation. Chapter 10, verse 10, tells us that in the beginning of Nimrod... The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, in the land of Shinar. Nimrod was only three generations from Noah. So what's going on here? This story of the Tower of Babel is describing a true event, an historic event, obviously. But it wasn't this kind of simplistic group travels to plain, group builds tower, God scatters people, and that's why we have Chinese and Mexicans. Like, that's not what's going on here. It's not that simplistic. What is the event that this story is describing? It's describing the collapse, the Bronze Age collapse. It's describing the events that happened at the end of the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age was this time of great um, wealth and prosperity and invention, And then it all collapsed and all these empires started to fail. And the Babylonian Empire failed. And then later on in Daniel, we get the Neo-Babylonian Empire. It's a different, but it's new. Anyway, we'll get into another time. Verse 3. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. 
and they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we disper be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. This is describing the building of the city of Babylon. It's not the first city, is it? That was Irad. Well, it wasn't Irad, but it, biblically it was Irad. It's not even the first city after the flood. This is five generations, three generations after Noah. They'd moved from somewhere else and started building a city. So it's not the first city, but it is a really significant city in world history and in the story of the church. But what this is describing is more than just a building project. It's about the Babylonian Empire. It's about building an empire. Something I, I don't think we quite grasp is just how connected the ancient world was. We have this idea, don't we, that we're very sophisticated and we have the internet and we have high speed travel and we're very connected to other parts of the world, but they probably didn't even know who's living over the next hill. We can sometimes think that way. That is not the case. Yes, they were separated geographically, they were different kingdoms, but at the time of the Babylonian Empire, the ancient world was very united. To give you a sense of this, the Babylonian Empire grew on the back of the discovery of bronze, hence it being called the Bronze Age, this stronger, better metal. And to make bronze, what the Babylonians did was they imported copper which they got from Cyprus. That's where copper gets its name. It's the, it's the metal of, Cy of Cyprus, copper. And they mixed it with tin that they got from Afghanistan. Right? They were bringing these, importing these metals from these relatively great distances for, that, for, for the ancient world, bringing them in and making bronze. Hammurabi, the emperor of the Babylonian Empire, is, is we know, he, he had a... Um, he would only wear Crete-style sandals. He would only wear sandals imported from Crete. I mean, you know, this is like this is every world leader ever, right? So we had them imported. The ancient world was very connected. We might even say the whole earth had one language and the same words. They were on the same page. And they were building not just a city, but an empire. And at the center of this empire was the Tower of Babel, which was, uh, and is, the great ziggurat of Babylon. So we've said this before, haven't we? A ziggurat is a type of temple. It's like a, it's a type of pyramid. It's a stepped pyramid. And it's interesting that we see these all over the world in lots of different cultures. But the, the idea is that it was a man-made mountain of God, a place where they could meet with God. Remember how we saw in Eden how God... Uh, met, dwelt on the mountain in Eden. And so what it's really talking about here is not just a building project, not just a tower, but a whole city and a whole civilization and a whole empire built around pagan worship, specifically the Nephilim ritual, which is what would happen in these ziggurats. In the middle of the ziggurat, there would be a room with that giant bed in it that we talked about before, for making giant kings. These half, half divine, half human kings. And why are they doing this then? Verse 4. Let us build a tower and a city and make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. First of all, notice what was humanity told to do through Adam and through Noah. Fill the earth, spread across the earth, take my life across the globe. But here they're like, no, we don't want to be dispersed. We want to stay here and consolidate power in cities. How? By reaching to heaven. So they build this empire and they build this city and at the centre of it all is this ziggurat, this tower, with its top in heaven. Now, they didn't think that they could build a tower big enough to physically reach in to the divine presence of heaven. It's not that ancient humans were stupid and thought, oh, I know, 
let's build a great big tower and we can climb up it and we can have tea with the gods. That's not what they were thinking. It was actually to bring God down. And you might think, well, that sounds, that's not what he says. But let's think what Paul says in the New Testament. Who has ascended to heaven? That is to bring God down. These things are linked. So the ziggurats, the pagan temples, were built to capture gods. Do you remember we talked about, um, when we talked about the, the creation of humans, we talked about when pagans dedicated a new temple, they would bring an idol in and they would hold an opening of the nostrils ceremony where the spirit would then enter the idol and they could now, that spirit would now serve them as their god. And what they would do is they would keep them in the temple, they'd serve them food, they'd give them things in order to manipulate the spirit into doing what they wanted. That is what idolatry is. We've said before, isn't it? You can't do an accidental idolatry in its truest sense. And that's what they want to do now with God, with Yahweh. They want to bring him down. They want to keep him in their temple. They want to trap him so they can manipulate him. This is, this is peak rebellion, isn't it? This is, instead of, God, instead of people obeying God, they want to make God obey them. They want to be over God. And we get one, one idea for its name here in the scriptures, for the name of Babylon. Uh, but there's another, another origin for its name, which is, Babylon is Bob, Bab Eli, which means gate of the gods. They were making this place where they could control the gods and have access to the gods and make the gods work for them. And so, verse 5, the Lord does come down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, this rebellion. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so that they may not understand one of the speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there, over the face of the earth and they left off building the city now the city's there but the empire isn't anymore do you see that's what it's talking about so god does come down he's not called down he chooses to go down not to do what they want but to bring justice and when he says there's no end to what they can do he's not thinking oh these humans are oh, they've nearly thwarted me ah it's they can destroy themselves if i don't do something they're going to consolidate themselves in their sin and they're going to destroy themselves. There's no end to what they will do to each other. Now, the problem with how we often read this account is that we stop there and we simply see the physical dimension to this story. And it becomes a bit like a, a Rudyard Kipling story, you know, and that's why we have all the languages of the world sort of thing. And that's why, it's one of the reasons why we often miss the third fall in here. Because we only see the physical aspects of the story. But there is more to this event than what is recorded here. And the other account of this event we find in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I think it's verse 8 we read this. Remember the days of old, when the Most High distributed nations... As he scattered the descendants of Adam, he set up boundaries for the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And his people Jacob became the portion of the Lord, Israel, an allotment of his inheritance. That's what, you see what Paul was saying there about he set up these boundaries, he put these things in place. So what, the, what is the extra information we get here in Deuteronomy? The, the big piece of extra information is we're told that when the nations were scattered at Babel, they were scattered according to the number of the angels of God. Now, we've just had chapter 10, where all the nations are listed. And if you count them, and you can't just count every name, you have to count it and work out which is a nation and which isn't. But there are 70. There are 70 of them. This is going to be a significant number throughout the Bible. 70, or actually 72, because remember, 70 equals 72. It's like 40 equals 42. 70 is always indicative of the nations. 
the Gentile nations. Well, whenever you see the word Gentile in the Bible, really just think 70 nations. Because there is Israel, which we'll see in a minute, isn't a nation, and then the nations, the 70. Okay? 70 is always indicative of the nations. So later in the Torah, there is the Feast of Tabernacles. And what happens is that 70 bulls are sacrificed for the nations. And so Israel is acting like a priest to the world, offering sacrifices on behalf of all the nations. 70. When Jesus sends out his apostles, how many does he send? 70. Showing that this message is not just for Israel, but it's for the whole world, for the nations. And this number 70 also matches up with the number in ancient Near Eastern sources, the number that was believed to be on the Council of the Gods. So this all adds up, isn't it? This, this idea, the idea here is that at Babel, each nation was allocated an angel. But why? Think again about the flood. We saw that the flood wasn't a punishment. It was consequence. The way the flood is described in chapter 7 is that the waters come up from the ground and come down from the sky, reversing that day, uh, the third days of creation when it went the other way. So in creation, God pushes back the chaotic waters and creates a safe space for humanity to live between the waters above and the waters below. And so in bringing the flood, all he does is he stops doing that. He stops withholding the chaos. He stops protecting humanity from chaos and evil. And so it is essentially death by holiness. As he steps back and goes, whoa, you're sinning. I have to step back now. And the chaos reensues. Humanity was so sinful he had to withdraw from them, withdrawing his protection. And so the chaos water came crashing down as a consequence. Well, now we're heading to the same dilemma, aren't we? Humanity is doing the same things they were doing before the flood. And so God needs to withdraw from humanity again. But, as he promised, this time he's not going to leave them in chaos. And so this time he appoints angels over every nation as a go-between to care for the people in his place. In the book of Enoch, they're called shepherds. Their role was to look after humans by leading them back to God. As Paul says in Acts, that you would find your way back. But something goes wrong. These angels eventually fall, setting themselves up as gods to be worshipped. Not bringing the people to the true God, but they got in the way and started accepting worship. So it's probably worth mentioning here as well that there are three falls of humans and there are actually five-ish falls of angels. And this is the final fall of humans. But remember, because a fall isn't, we, isn't just a moral failing. That's the way we often use it, don't we? But it's a, literally a change in status. Humanity has now fallen further, having been put under the care of of the angels and what we see portrayed throughout the bible is that the angels join humanity in their fall by accepting the worship that's offered to them and babel is seen as the start of that process of god saying right i'm putting you under these angels and so babel and babylon becomes this picture of the world this emblem of humans and demons rebelling together against Jesus. We see it right way through the Bible all the way into Revelation, don't we? And so this is where all false religions come from. And when I say all false religions, I mean every religion which isn't Christianity. I know this isn't going to score me many points with the tolerance movement, but all other religions are demonic. And if you take anything more than just a cursory glance at them, it becomes, that becomes very clear very quickly. This is where world religions come from. Babel. As we have said before, there are other gods. The Bible is very clear on that point. 
How can Jesus be the Lord of lords or the God above gods if there are not other beings which are called gods? This is where the Bible makes a distinction. They are not the true God, are they? But they are gods. They are worshipped by people. And humanity has put themselves under the, the power of these spirits. We have chosen them over Jesus. And so the nations are handed over. This is what Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up because they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. These gods aren't nothing. They hold power over nations. They can affect world politics. They can start wars, bring plague, bring famine. We need saving from death. We need saving from sin. And we need saving from them. Who will save us? Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. God has taken his place among the 70 angels. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So Jesus takes his place above all the other gods to judge them, to deal with them. And what does he say? He says to them, Psalm 82, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? He's saying, you were meant to be humanity's salvation and bring them to me. You were meant to help the weak and the fatherless. You were meant to deliver them from the hand of the wicked. You were meant to bring them back to me. But instead you benefited yourselves and you showed favour to evil humans. And so he says, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. Psalm 82 is one of my favourite psalms. I know I have a lot of them, but that's one of them. It describes Jesus' ascension, his arising, as he takes back the nations, as he comes and sorts out all the rebel gods. After the cross, he has the, given authority to deal with, with the problems and to bring all people to himself. You see, by Jesus' blood and sacrifice, we are made holy and able to once again be in relationship with God through Jesus. And so we belong to Jesus. That's what it means for us to be saved. Saved from death, yes. Saved from sin, yes. But also saved from the malevolent, domineering, oppressing influence of these fallen angels. Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. And this was the plan from the beginning, of course. We see the promise after the first fall, don't we? The seed of Mary will crush the devil. But we also see this promise of Babel. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 says, He divided mankind, fixed their borders according to the numbers of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is the people, is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. God divides the nations, placing them under the guardianship of the angels, but he takes an allotment for himself. Not a nation, just a man. One man, Abraham. Immediately after Babel in Genesis 11, the very next thing that happens in chapter 12 is we read of the Lord calling Abraham and calling him out. And what does he say? I'm going to make you into a great nation. Jesus is going to be the shepherd over Abraham and his family. He's going to be hands-on with them. He is their God. He's going to be meeting with them, speaking to them, leading them, bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them to conquer all the giant clans, and eventually redeeming people from every nation of the world into his one family. 
Who is that family? The church. The church is the true Israel. Galatians 3 verse 7 says, Know, that, know then that it is those who are faithful to Jesus who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the 70 nations by faithfulness preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you shall all the 70 nations be blessed. And so then, those who are faithful to Jesus are blessed along with Abraham. The church is God's portion. Not any one nation in the world that they could claim it. God doesn't take a nation of the world to be his people. He takes a man and makes his own nation. Not a nation of earth, but a kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we hear these ideas, don't we? Like a particular nation belongs to God somehow. Whether it be the UK or the USA or Israel. But they are not. And I, they are not God's kingdom. There are times indeed when nations have good Christian leaders. And those nations can know real blessing under those rulers. But they are not God's people. Only the church is. The church that can be found now in every nation of the world. It started with one man called out of the nations, Abraham. But it has grown into every nation. And how do we become part of this great nation, the church? Well, by coming out from under the demonic powers of the world. Jesus in his ministry, death, resurrection and ascension has defeated the world powers and principalities and offers us safety when we come into his church, when we come into the ark, when we are washed and exorcised in baptism. In the fall at Babel, one people were scattered into many nations. In the church, many nations are united to be one people in Jesus. If you look at that uh, icon of the Tower of Babel that I sent in the group this week, you will see that the ziggurat um, is surrounded by a whole bunch of people painted to look Egyptian and Chinese and Persian and Native American and European. And above each of them, if you notice, they have like a halo. But in the halo is an angel, is a spiritual being. At Babel, every nation was put under their own angel, their own spirits. And what happened? Their language was confused. They're no longer on the same page. Fast forward to the New Testament. There is an event that undoes Babel. Pentecost. At Pentecost, the day we often think of as the birth of the New Testament church, what happens? Well, for one, there's first no confusion in languages. Peter preaches, and everyone hears it, in their own language. If here in Genesis 11, the confusing of languages is used as a device to describe the disunity between people and being put under many angels, then at Pentecost, the clarity of language is used to describe the unity that comes through the church. What else happens in Pentecost in the upper room? The people are no longer under many different spirits, but they all come under one Holy Spirit as the tongues of fire come to rest on the disciples. Let me round some of this up um, with the caveat that, as I said, next week we're going to do like a big roundup with more of this stuff. Um, so we'll apply more of this next week. But for now, let's just drill down into a couple of, and again, this is expansive, isn't it? It's far-reaching, literally a couple of places where we can, this can help us to begin to understand world religions and world events and what this means for us as we live in this world that is this way first of all we need to recognize that there are not just human rulers over nations but spiritual rulers too the, we we heard about this in daniel do you remember when the angels comes to daniel is like oh sorry i'm late i was waylaid by the prince of persia he's speaking about the angel that's over persia but you know, don't worry because michael came to help me and we sorted him out and i'm here now yeah we get this picture we can elect new politicians. There can be new kings. But there is a spiritual reality that will never be changed unless a nation truly, truly turns to Jesus. 
This isn't a change that affected the ballot box. It's a change that is effective when the church is real and grows. And this is what happened when nations first became Christians, when the gospel first spread across the world. When I say when, when the nation really becomes Christian, I'm not talking about the modern idea of revival, where just kind of enough individuals turn their heart to the Lord. I'm talking about back when a king was a king. And when, when that king became a Christian, well, then the whole nation was converted. Churches were built. And the life of the country and the civilization literally changed. And there were no longer pagan offerings offered to demons, but instead the land was worshipping Jesus. When that happened, what would happen is the nation would take a patron saint. The idea being that they recognised that in place of that fallen spiritual being that was over them, now that being has been replaced by a saint who is now over the nation, becoming a divine advocate for the nation to Jesus. There is a real and spiritual reality to nations. I really don't want to wade into this too deeply for reasons which will become obvious as I start to wade into it. Uh, but this chapter also gives us some understanding for what is happening in Palestine just now. When we read the Table of Nations in chapter 10, Israel isn't there. Israel isn't one of the 70. It was never meant to be a nation. It was God's allotment. Or it was never meant to be an earthly nation. It was God's allotment that would not be tied to any particular nation of the world, but was meant to bring people out of every nation of the world. Israel was always meant to be a transnational people. We see this in the Exodus. Now, I am actually not making any comment about the current political climate. I'm not saying, therefore, that it means that Jewish people as an ethnic group don't deserve a home. I'm also not saying that it's therefore impossible or wrong um, for the world to acknowledge a new nation if the world so desires to do that. What I am saying is, there is no mandate in Scripture to establish the modern nation of Israel. I think it's important to say because some people think there is. Israel has already received everything they were promised from God in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land. He gave them all the land that he swore to them. And they took possession of it and they settled there. God has fulfilled his promise to them, which actually was not primarily about them getting land, but was about God using his church to rid, them of, rid that land of giants, with the idea that from there, from Jerusalem, that place where Eden is understood to have been, that they would then spread across the whole world, ordering it and filling it, as the church is now doing. So God already fulfilled his promise, to Israel. They got all the land that they, pro they were promised, and then, of course, they lost it again. Why? Because of unfaithfulness. And my question if, to Christians who, who think otherwise, why do we think God is now going to give it back to them whilst they openly reject Jesus, the ultimate unfaithfulness? We are the true Israel. The church is God's allotment. We are the ones who are not at home in this world. We are the ones who are persecuted in every nation of the world. There is not a Christian nation. And there is not a place where all Christians can call home and go other than the church. There is no place where the law of God is perfectly executed that is what the church is meant to be in every nation. So there is that, there is that level of the understanding of the world, of, of politics and nations, and helping us to see why there are wars. And there is, of course, a lot more that can be said. But let us turn to what Genesis 11 means for each of us in our homes and our communities. And so first remember this. The modern world doesn't acknowledge it. But our world is filled with spirits, angels, demons, and saints. 
They are not a strange aberration. They are an everyday reality. And so how should we respond to this? Acknowledging that for some of us may sound scary, may feel us with, you're saying there's demons everywhere. Yeah, there is. But there's also angels and saints and spirit. And so many people live in denial. Well, I can't think of that. I'm just going to deny all that. They're, they're scared. Other people have a dangerous fascination with them and pursue them and go looking for them. We do neither of those things. We acknowledge the devils. But we do not fear them. Because we are no longer under them. We have come out from the nations. We have been brought into the kingdom of the church. And so we may live like we may live in a nation that is animated by a fallen spirit. We may live lives surrounded by demons, but our lives and our homes can be embassies of the kingdom of heaven. How do they become that? With prayer. With prayer. We fill our homes with constant prayer, with incense, with candlelight, those sacrifices that welcome the presence of God in. We fill our homes with icons of the saints, not just reminding ourselves of the unseen reality, but entering into it, surrounding ourselves with those who are praying for us, rather than worrying about those who are trying to destroy us. We fill our homes with so much of Jesus that there is no space for the devils. We fill our days with love and service, with patience and kindness, with gentleness and self-control as we come to divine worship as often as we can and receive the holy sacrament of the Eucharist. Church is the ark, the place where we are kept safe by and in Jesus, safe from the fallen spirits of our world. And so... This influences how we do evangelism. Every other religion and belief system, including atheism, secularism, humanism, all of it is animated by fallen spiritual beings. And their whole aim is to keep people away from Jesus, to trap people and control people and oppress people. And so, if we want to see people saved... If we want to see people brought into the kingdom, if we want to see people brought out from under the oppression of these fallen spiritual beings, the ultimate answer is not apologetics. It's not having a killer argument or putting on the right events or being able to answer all of their questions. It's prayer. Yes, sure, like Paul, we go out and have intelligent conversations with unbelievers about the state of the world but they will not see the truth of Jesus whilst ever there is a fallen spirit clouding their minds and so the first and biggest thing we must do is pray for that to be removed for them to be saved from the demons so that they can be saved from sin and death Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle against the human mind, but against the animating spirit behind it that is keeping it closed, that is blinding the mind's eye, the nous of the person. Pray against that, that their mind may be opened. Evangelism isn't about who has the best ideas and the best answers it really is who has the most powerful God and we do and this isn't tribalism this isn't just like you know my God is better than your God this is simply people are trapped by evil spirits and only God can save them unbelievers and their ideas are not our enemies they are the captives of our enemies Jesus has saved us from the tyranny of the demons. And so we say, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.